today we will be reading from 2 Thessalonians uh, chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. These verses can be found on page 575 of the Bibles underneath your chair. And if you don't own a Bible, we would love for you to take one home as a gift from us. All right, we'll begin in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and being gathered together to him, we ask you, brothers, do not be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed, either by a spirit or a spoken word or a, letting, a letter seeming to be from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? And you know that you know what is restraining him now so that he may be revealed in his time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains it will do so until he is out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring, noth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan with all power and false signs and wonders. And with all wicked deception for those who are perishing, because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. Therefore, God sends them a strong delusion so that they may believe what is false in order that all may be condemned who do not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Lauren. Good morning. Good to see you. Welcome to Mercy View. Uh, my name is Brad, one of the pastors here, and uh, before we get going, I just want to echo um, the welcome to Will Rogers Church. Thank you so much for uh, coming uh, here to worship with us in your space. Um, yeah, yeah. Thank you. And uh, I just want to say something um, on behalf of our congregation. Um, we, we are a church that's been around for about 13 years, and um, we have never had our own home, um, and that's okay. Uh, we have had to lean on and depend on others to have a, a space to worship in, and we've had a few different homes through the years, um, but we could not be more thrilled to be in this space at this time in our uh, history as a church. and, and I just want to say to you, if you're here from Will Rogers Church, how deeply grateful we are that you have so graciously opened your doors to us. I, and I just need to tell you this, that is not necessarily a common thing here in our city. Because we've been through a, a, this a few times in different spaces, sometimes the search for a place reveals quite a bit about the kingdom mindedness or the lack thereof in our own city, which is sad, actually. But I want to say to you, you all exemplify what is actually uncommon in our city by being so kingdom minded. Uh, we are so grateful for the way that you have um, allowed us to come in and use your space. That is no small thing. And so I, I want to say to you, Greg, thank you, brother, for all that you've done to help us uh, worship here. Um, and the board at Will Rogers, if you're a member at Will Rogers, um, we are so grateful for the ways that, that you have, really, you've loved us in that way. So thank you so much. Um, we are honored to worship alongside you today. In 2016, uh, the Oxford Dictionary's um, word of the year was post-truth. What year is it right now? 2024, so eight years ago. The word of the year was post-truth. Because that word began showing up in a lot of news articles and news stories. Um, it became such a, a, a common word that the dictionary, P 
people said, hey, we got to add this to uh, the, the dictionary. And uh, author and church planner Carrie Newhoff says, this is what a post-truth culture looks like. He says, don't like the outcome of what's happening? Claim it never happened. Bothered by what the data says? Offer your own data even if you have to make it up. In the emerging culture, truth is no longer subjective or objective. It's personal. Don't like something? Great. Tell everyone it never happened. Explain that it doesn't exist. Just spin your version of the story until you've constructed your own personal universe of what's real and what's not. And then he closes this quote by saying this. Why face reality when you can deny it instead? The reality of a post-truth world and culture that if that wasn't I mean if that was true eight years ago it is for sure it's it's surely true today it is the waters that we swim within and in this post-truth world that we walk through feelings trump facts personal subjectivity matters more than objective reality and what this has done to our culture is that it no longer poses a threat to how we should live. And, and so we turn the truth to our own ends, using it for our own purposes. We spin words until the truth serves our own efforts. And in the end, what happens, and what I fear is happening among us, is that we lose ourselves under a strong delusion, to use Paul's words. And if we're not careful, as long as we stay in the fog of our own delusion, it'll keep us from Jesus. Because Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the very embodiment of the truth that we seek. He is the one who is the foundation for all other truth. But because we are self-deceived, we can't see through the fog of that. We do something then. We resist the truth. Or we could maybe say it this way. We don't love the truth. We are in a series this summer in the New Testament book of 2 Thessalonians called Unshakable. And if you're visiting with us this morning, our custom here at Mercy View is to primarily preach through books of the Bible, passage by passage, because we feel that all Scripture is breathed out by God. As Paul calls it, it is the whole counsel of God, and it truly is profitable to us for teaching, for reproof for correction and for training in righteousness and so we are making our way through uh, second Thessalonians this summer in, in light of that and today's passage just so you know uh, is no exception for what we are attempting to do here at Mercy View this passage um, some have said is maybe the most obscure and difficult passage of any of Paul's writings, right? So it would be tempting to be like, man, this is just too hard. We're going to skip over this. But um, because we believe what we believe about the Word of God, um, we're going to jump into this passage. It's a tough one. Um, but uh, as we look at this challenging passage together, I want really to invite you to see two things. And, and the first one is this. The word of Jesus brings hope to the faithful. The word of Jesus brings hope to the faithful. And then second, I want you to see this. The truth of Jesus brings salvation to the sinner. The truth of Jesus brings salvation to the sinner. So if you have your Bibles or electronic devices, keep them open there to... Second Thessalonians chapter 2, beginning there in verse 1, and 
As you are looking there, let me just give you a little um, context for what's happening here, especially for those of you that are visiting with us, jumping into this um, with us. Apparently, the false teachers uh, of that area there in Thessalonica are starting to make inroads into the church of Thessalonica. This church that um, Paul is writing this letter to was a church that he helped plant. And so it's a young church. It's not a very big church. Um, and there are people in that city who are not happy about that church being there. It's a very pagan city. It's a, it's a seaport, uh, which, which means it has a lot of different kinds of people um, that are in that city. And there are people who are not happy about this church preaching the gospel and, and living the gospel out together. And apparently some false teachers had come to the church and said, hey, we are, we've got something that is actually from Paul. Um, and we don't know exactly if it was a prophecy or a teaching or even a letter that they claim was coming from Paul. But these false teachers are coming to this church plant and saying, hey, we got something from Paul and you need to read this or hear this because... It's new information that you may not know. And interestingly enough, the information that they brought uh, conflicted with what Paul had already told them about. If you look at verse 5, Paul basically says, Hey, look guys, we've already talked about this. You should know that this isn't true. But Paul, because he cares for his friends there in this church, he wants to encourage them and help them see what the truth is. And so here is what the, the, either the letter or the prophecy or... Uh, 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 the, the teaching that was coming to them from these false teachers. They were basically saying to the Thessalonican church, hey, you guys missed the day of the Lord. Like you guys totally somehow missed what is called the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is this term in the Bible that describes the judgment that God brings at the end of the age. And so the, the false teachers were saying, hey, you guys missed that somehow. So Paul is saying that someone or, or, or something had come into their midst and it said, hey, look, this has already happened. And now those claims, again, were clearly false. And the church there should have known that. But look at verse 2. It says that they were shaken in mind or alarmed. In other words, they have been um, rustled. Their, their, their emotions, their, their feeling of security, the like like the knowledge that they should have had about that. They're starting to like doubt that. And, it, and I actually think it's somewhat understandable. I want you to think about this just for a moment. Paul, if he was wrong about what he had previously said, and these folks are bringing some new information that contradicts what Paul said, then that means Paul is a fraud. It means Paul is not trustworthy, right? What, what would it mean for you to have somebody come to you and say something to you that you think is the truth, but then someone else comes alongside and says, hey, that thing that that person said to you is a lie, you would start to question the other person who supposedly told you the truth, right? So Paul knows his people well. This is a group of friends that, again, he helped plant this church. And so out of love for his friends, he wants to remind them of the truth. He wants to remind them of what he had taught them before. So what had Paul taught them? You don't have to turn there, but if you go back a book in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, here's what Paul told them about the day of the Lord. He said that the day of the Lord would be unmistakable, like for everybody. No one could possibly miss it. Whether you're a believer or not a believer, it's unmistakable. There's no way to miss it. So what Paul is trying to then say is, is you haven't missed it. Let me, let me tell you what's going to happen. Paul is going to tell them, here's what's going to happen before the day of the Lord happens. Let me remind you of the, the truth. And so, Paul is going to say that there are two things that are going to happen before the day of the Lord. Look with me at verse 3. Here's where he tells them what those two things are. He says, that day will not come unless first... The rebellion comes, and second, the man of lawlessness is revealed. 
Now, let's just stop there for a moment. Um, as I said last week, for those of us that were here last week, Paul, um, we're, you can already get a sense of this, we're, we're talking about what's called eschatology, the, the study or the understanding of the end times, what's going to happen at the end of the age. We got a little dose of that last week. We are going into the deep end this week. Paul is going to jump into the deep end of the pool and say, guys, you need to understand, I need to remind you of, of what I told you about what's going to happen before the day of the Lord. He says two things. One, rebellion, and two, the man of lawlessness is revealed. So first, Paul calls this thing a rebellion, a revolt that's going to take place before the Lord. And really a word that you could substitute for that is the idea of apostasy. That's probably a better word that captures actually what Paul is talking about. Let me tell you what I mean by that. Um, Paul is talking about, this, again, this is the first thing that's going to happen before the day of the Lord, a rebellion or a falling away that is going to happen in the world. Now, no matter what your position is on eschatology, the end times, this apostasy, all, all like positions on eschatology, agree that there is going to be some kind of observable, measurable event where there is a widespread abandonment of a formerly professed faith and then a defection, a widespread defection of people from the church en masse. Now this is not some sporadic, intermittent abandonment like some of us have, have probably noticed, particularly in the last probably decade or so, stories of folks who have deconstructed or have become ex-evangelicals. Those are stories of apostasy, but this particular event that Paul is talking about here is something that is much larger, a larger group of people, even worldwide, are going to um, have a mutiny. A mutiny against God, a mutiny of their faith and of the church, and it will be of worldwide proportions. But there is a second thing that, that, that must take the place before the day of the Lord as well. Paul says that the man of lawlessness must be revealed. And we're going to spend a little time here because this is a really interesting character that Paul mentions here, and uh, I think we need to just dig a, a little deeper here to understand exactly what Paul I I is dealing with here. Paul is describing a person. Let me just read that again for us at the top of verse 3 for context. He says, For that day will not come until the rebellion comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed. And he gives him this title, the son of destruction. Some of your Bibles might translate that word destruction as perdition. Now, that's a very uncommon word for us. We don't use that word often. But, but whether it's destruction or perdition, both of those words mean ruin. And so let's just stop there for a moment. We can take Paul's words here for, for, for this and, and, and start to put together who this person is. It's a man, all right? So it's a, it's a human being. And as we said before, he's going to be revealed. Another way you could think of this is that uh, essentially God is going to take his his uh, protection away from, uh, his, even his common grace away from the world at that moment, and the, the man of lawlessness will be released to do the work that uh, this passage is going to tell us about here in just a moment. Now, notice in verse 3 that Paul calls this man a man of lawlessness, as well as a son of destruction. Again, both of those mean ruin or even damnation. In fact, there's one other place in the Bible where that title is given to someone. And if you're familiar with your Bible, you're familiar with the story of Jesus, his ministry, this will be no uh, surprise to you. That title was also given to Judas. But what, what Paul means by all of this is that this man is the personification of someone who is against God's law. So much so that there is no law fullness within him. He is a man of lawlessness, which is how, again, destruction is, is meant to be 
understood here. Now, this is an interesting thing because um, many people believe that the man of lawlessness is the Antichrist, which if you're familiar with the end times conversation, you know that term as well. But there is a, a belief, some have, that, that this man is actually not the Antichrist. He's a man who prepares the way for the Antichrist. And you're free to decide how you want to uh, interpret that. But Paul um, goes on to, to talk about what this man will do. And that's, I think, important for us to see here as well. Look there, verse 4. He says this. He opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship. And then he said he will do this, as it says in verse 9. Look there. By the activity of Satan, with all power and false signs and wonders... And with all wicked deception for those who are perishing. So, this man of lawlessness. Again, remember, we're talking about the second thing that Paul is reminding his friends um, has to happen before the day of the Lord. There is going to be a man of lawlessness who promotes himself in the place of God as the central deity to be worshipped. And he will ultimately seize the place of Christ... At this time, as the head of the church, universal, through counterfeit miracles. I know that's a lot, okay? Let me just say, say that again. This man of lawlessness will, will gain such prominence and popularity that he will actually begin to be worshipped in the place of God. He will become the object of worship for many and this not, will just like not only happen in Tulsa, okay? This is something that's going to happen worldwide. It's going to have worldwide impact. And the lawlessness efforts to receive worship results, actually, as it says in verse 4, he is going to take his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. We see echoes of that idea in other places in the Scripture, we don't have time to look at all of those this morning, but if you're curious, the book of Daniel, the book of Isaiah, the book of Ezekiel, even Jesus in his ministry in the book of Matthew talks about this, this person. The fact that this man will take the place of God in the temple of God likely also means that he will come from within the church. Now look with me at verse 6. Paul continues to talk about the man of lawlessness, and he says something really interesting. He says that this man of lawlessness is currently being restrained, or he's being restrained. Now, Paul doesn't identify who the restrainer is. Uh, there's a lot of healthy debate about that, too, and if you want to grab coffee, we can, we can talk about who, who you think that may be. But um, what we do know is that the man of lawlessness is being restrained by a power or a person until it is the right time for him to be revealed or released. Now, verse 7 says that the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. And we need to make a distinction here. We've been talking about the man of lawlessness. Now we're talking about the mystery of lawlessness. In other words, Paul is saying... Though there is coming a, 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 a day where the man of lawlessness will be revealed and, and released, do know this, the mystery of lawlessness, the reality of lawlessness is already at work today. In other words, even in our day, like our day today, um, lawlessness, sin, even as 1 John 2 and 2 John 7 mention, Antichrists are everywhere. And friends, you don't have to look any further than the opening ceremonies of the Olympics yesterday. There is a, 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 an attempt to offend not only God's people, but God himself. What happened in the opening ceremonies was a blasphemy. And though that is true right now for us as we see that in our world, the final satanic plan to overthrow God 
and to bring forth the man of lawlessness, that has not yet happened. He has not yet been revealed. So who is doing the restraining? We just said it's a, it's a mysterious power or person. We don't know for sure. But what we do know is that nothing is done without the Lord. And in some sense, at least, the Lord himself, either directly or maybe through his spirit, which he's given to us, or through others, namely the church, there is something supernaturally restraining the restrainer. Now quickly, let's deal real quick with a, a question that you might have at this point. I know we're in the deep end of the pool here, but you might be wondering, and this, this depends on kind of your take on the end times, but like when does all of this happen, right? I, up to this point, you, you are probably assuming that I'm talking about something that happens in the future. Um, depending on your eschatology, the when of all of this may be different. Let me tell you what I mean by that. In his book, um, From Age to Age, theologian and author Keith Matheson says, you really have four options with a passage like 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 12. Here's the first two. The first option is all the preliminary signs and the day of the Lord has already occurred. Now, that is a very rare view in the church. S some call that the full preterist view. Um, most Christians, most of Christianity, Orthodox Christianity, would not hold to that, would, would say that's out of the bounds, really, of, uh, of Christianity. Because if you even look at, like, the creeds, the Nicene Creed, the Apostles' Creed, others, even though we ha may have different opinions on how all this is going to go down, even when it may go down, all the creeds are in unison about something, and that is Christ will come to judge the living and the dead. That seems to be a statement about the future. Now, that's option one. Option two is this. All of the preliminary signs have occurred, but the day of the Lord has not yet come. Um, that is also a rare view. In this view, the apostasy happened most likely in AD 70 with, with, with all of the signs when the Romans revolted and destroyed the temple. So in other words, if, if this is kind of where you land, what Paul is talking about here is not about something that's happened in the future. He's speaking in such a way to describe something that's actually already happened in the past. Option three, though, some of the preliminary signs have either occurred or are beginning to occur, but since all of them have not yet occurred, the day of the Lord cannot come yet. That's option three. In this view, uh, the apostasy and the release of the man of lawlessness may have already happened. Um, it may not have, or it's maybe begun to happen, but other signs have not yet occurred, namely the, the visible physical re return of Christ, uh, judgment, the final defeat of Satan and the resurrection of the living and the dead and the new heavens and the new earth, right? So in this option, there is still some signs to, to come and the day of the Lord has not yet come. For the record, not that it matters. Um, that's where I'm at. Um, like, I think we see an increasing cultural apostasy happening in our time, but not yet an ecclesial apostasy, which is what Paul is ultimately talking about here. Option four is that none of the signs have occurred, so the day of the Lord has, hasn't come yet either. And that's a very commonly held view as well, um, that the signs, all of the signs are yet to come. The day of the Lord is also yet to come. Now, I, that was a lot. Um, so we need to start to move towards something together. Why is Paul talking to his friends in this church plant in Thessalonica about this. Remember, we've already seen in, um, if you've been with us in this series, in the first chapter of this book, this congregation in Thessalonica was going through deep affliction and persecution. Those were the words that Paul used. And, and they were experiencing this because of their faithfulness to God. And actually, in the face of affliction and persecution, their love for one another and their faith in God actually grew. But Paul recognizes something about his friends in this church, and it's this. And you guys know this. You've experienced this yourself. 
when people are suffering, when they're afflicted by something, maybe even when they're being persecuted, they are, listen, vulnerable. They are ripe for believing almost anything that promises some kind of relief. So here come the false teachers to give them that, in a sense. And Paul did not want them to be taken in by untruth, by what was really irresponsible and unhelpful teaching. He knew that that teaching, if they embraced it, would cause that vulnerability to just grow. It would actually cause more harm. And so he's writing to them to give them, yes, a a big dose of eschatology, but for a particular purpose. Now, there is a spot in particular in this chapter I want us to look at because this, I think, was Paul's intention to uplift the Thessalonican church. Look with me, if you would, at verse 8. Here's what it says again. Let me just start at the beginning. And then the lawless one will be revealed. And then listen to this. Whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath, or the word you could could say that, of his mouth and bring to what? Nothing by the appearance of his coming. This brings me to the first thing I want to invite you to see this morning. The word of Jesus brings hope to the faithful. If we look at this passage today and all we come away with is like the future is terrible, (laughs) like the rebellion and the apostasy and the man of lawlessness and all that he's going to do, like that's horrible, like that's going to be really bad, Um, we have missed the main point of what Paul's trying to talk about to us today. Listen, if you are a Christian today, you have placed your faith and trust in Jesus. You say, I, that is my story. I'm following Jesus the rest of my days. You are meant to read a passage like this today and rejoice even more deeply and find your heart aching for the day when all of this will be undone and the new heavens and the new earth will come when Jesus appears in all of his majesty. On that day, Christ will come as a victor, and every eye will see him, and every knee will bow to him, and every tongue will confess him as Lord. So how does Jesus do this? Don't don't miss how Paul describes it. Jesus will end the arrogant activity of the lawless, lawless one with what? A breath of his mouth. Isaiah prophesied that the shoot from the stump of Jesse would kill the wicked with the breath of his lips. Friends, Jesus is going to just simply appear, breathe out his word, and the darkest power of hell will be annihilated. So Paul wants to tell his friends, hey, I know what you're walking through. I know it's difficult. There is a lot of things that are distressing you, things that are striking you. But listen, he's saying to his friends and he's saying to us, God is still the sovereign king. And as Psalm 2 says, the ends of the earth are the son's possession. So friends, today's today's gospel message is that There will be a once and for all defeat of every one of God's enemies. Satan, sin, death, even as we talked last week, anyone who has resisted him. So even when things seem worse for this church, like the worst for this church, Paul is saying, guys, remember, Jesus is going to appear and effortlessly bring the enemy to nothing. That is what makes us unshakable. Verse 2, Paul 
notices his friends are being shaken. So what is he trying to do? He's trying to say, this is what makes you unshakable. Paul is writing, yes, to his friends in the Thessalonican church, but he's writing to us to say, anchor your confidence in the fact of the Christian hope found in the power of the word from the breath of Jesus. Regardless of your eschatology, you can bank on that this morning. Friends, we know, we should know, who is in charge of history, right? The future for us is all glorious because our hope is found in King Jesus. We can find deep hope and comfort in that because we are looking to King Jesus as our Lord and Savior. In other words, we don't have to live in fear. We can know that the same God who created the universe sustains the universe. And he will consummate it according to his design one day. And on that day, it is a dismantling of satanic power and the explosion of divine judgment making all things right. And recreating this world as the new heavens and the new earth for us to live in forever. So we live within that hope today, by grace, and we find comfort and strength for whatever comes our way in the future because of that. The question for us this morning is this, is your future secure? How would you know? I want to close our time here. If you would look with me at verse 9 again. Let me read that for us beginning there at verse 9. Here's what it says. The coming of the lawless one, lawless one is by the activity of Satan with all power and false signs and wonders and with all wicked deception for those who are perishing because, and here's what I, I want you to see, they refused to love the truth and to be saved. Therefore God sends them a strong delusion so that they may believe what is false in order that all may be condemned who did not believe. And there it is again, the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. This brings me to the second thing I want to invite you to see this morning. If you want to be able to answer the question, is your future secure? And how would you know that it is? The second thing I want you to see is this, the truth of Jesus brings salvation to the sinner. Or we could say it this way, Paul is saying, to those who love the truth of the gospel will be saved. But to those who love the lie, the counterfeit, they will be damned in the lie. Or we could say it one other way. If you don't love the truth, you are vulnerable. See, Paul is labeling any teaching opposed to the message of the gospel that's in his eschatology here. He's saying anything that is against that is an effort at deception. Anything that comes your way, my way, that's meant to get us to think differently about all that we just talked about is the enemy's attempt to deceive you. It's what Paul says there. It's, it's what it means to be deluded, right? To, to believe what is false. As we believe what is false, it, we begin to have pleasure in unrighteousness. It's the opposite of treasuring and enjoying and loving the truth. And I, I just need to say this too. Knowing the truth isn't enough, by the way. Um, Paul is saying that you must love it. In other words, your affections for Jesus are the confirmation of your salvation. If you have... Uh, a love for the truth of the gospel, and that's resulting in a love for Jesus. Jesus brings salvation to you. 
Like the demons, even the demons know the truth. As James says in his letter. But Paul is saying that if we do not love the truth, the Lord may and, and does give people over to their delusion, their, their strong delusion or untruth. Or maybe we could even say it this way. He gives them over to a post-truth existence. St. Augustine once said it this way, to believe a lie and not believe the truth is indeed sin. But it comes from the blindness of heart, which by a hidden but just judgment of God is also a punishment for sin. But for those who love God and love his truth, false doctrine, false teaching has no power over them. So friends, we must take the reality of deceit and deception very seriously. We need to realize that we live in a, a world where there is far more than various competing beliefs, ideas and ideologies and even religions and philosophies. There is one source that is animating that all, all of those things. Now, not every idea or belief that you run up against may be something of a, diab a biological, excuse me, diabolical idea or belief. But many of them have a satanic source. The question for us is, can you tell the difference? I think that we are far too casual on this as believers, about the reality of deception in our own lives, deception around us. Friends, Satan exists and he is working overtime to deceive you. Overtime. Sin also exists, that's, that's very real, and he works powerfully, uh, that works powerfully to deceive us as well. The Bible constantly warns us about this, the dangers of being deceived by both of those things, by Satan and by sin. And so, we, we have to be vigilant on this. Like, as we seek to live by and promote the truth and guard against error, we have to get it settled in our hearts, like, truth matters, Lies exist and deception abounds. So we must walk carefully and in the power of God and the spirit, which is the spirit of truth, as John 16 says. So let me just do this real quick before we end here. Let me just broaden this just a little bit. This is not just about you as an individual either. And we all would do well to ask ourselves these questions personally between us and, and the Lord. But there is always the imminent danger of deception in the church as well. Because Satan is disguised as an angel of light and his ministers, demons, are disguised as angels of light. They want to do what Satan wants to do and that's to devour you with confusion, to devour us with confusion, to devour us with error and deception. That's why we, as a local church, can no longer be, listen, children, as Ephesians 4 says, tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the cunning craftiness and deception of Satan. We have to be alert together. We have to realize that there is evil that is going to grow and, and deceive more and more people and you and I together are called to resist that evil. Paul's word in verse 3 is a very strong warning. I don't know if you caught it. He said, let no one deceive you in any way. That means no matter what form may come our way as a church, a prophecy, a sermon, a, a book, a letter, Whatever it is, written, spoken, whatever it may be, Paul is saying to us as a church, don't let anyone by any means or method lead you into any deception. Here's the deal. 
Individual Christians who are not explicitly committed to following Christ and submitting to his authority in all of life will drift from him. And some into apostasy. That's what Paul is talking about here. And he's talking about a, a world, one of worldwide proportions. And whether it's these intermittent versions of this or at the end, it will happen to those who claim to follow Christ. But churches that are not explicitly committed to biblical faithfulness will also drift from it. And some of those churches into apostasy. Christian institutions that are not explicitly committed to biblical fidelity will also eventually, and we see this happening even in our day, they will eventually renounce it and move towards, if not full-blown, apostasy. That is the pattern, unfortunately. That is what delusion looks like in real time. That is, for those individuals and churches and Christian institutions, what a post-truth existence looks like. Pastor Josh Bly says it this way, the problem of a post-truth age is that there is not just one problem. A post-truth culture feeds on the denial of truth. Our culture cannot answer the simple question, what is a woman? Our churches cannot answer the simple question, what is a pastor? Our political leaders cannot answer the simple question, what is a baby? As the darkness continues to build, there are enemies of the truth who are preparing to attack the foundation of our civilization with even more issues that will further divide and threaten our way of life. Now that may seem really strong to you, and that's okay, I mean, it is strong. <laughs> but Josh is saying, don't be surprised. If around you, or within maybe your own Christian circles, many are going to resist the truth more and more. They are not going to love the truth. Many today don't love the Christ of the truth. They're doing more than presuming on God's grace in that, by the way. Like, they're refusing God's grace when that happens because they prefer sin over the truth. That's why this isn't a matter of intellect and knowledge. This is a moral decision. It is a matter of the heart. And so Christians and churches and Christian institutions that don't love the truth will reap the reward of their unbelief. God can only confirm such folks to their own fate. But this passage from Paul today serves as a powerful warning to us. And it's this. Don't go there. Don't go to that place. Repent and turn from sin today. Because in repentance we find grace and mercy in our time of need. And in that we find hope for today and for the future. To believe in and love the truth, you can know that you will never be swept away, either as an individual or for us as a, a church, by a counterfeit. And we will spend then an eternity with our King, King Jesus, who will wipe away every tear from our eyes. And death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. If you want that to be your story this morning, and this is the first time that you've heard this kind of message about who Jesus is, we're going to have a prayer team over here to my left. They would love to talk to you about what it means to get this settled, your future settled. Most of us here this morning are, are followers of Jesus. And Paul's word to us is do not be deceived. Let's pray together.